My name is Carrie Fuso. I'm the coordinator of the Cross Cultural Center here on uh, Pasadena City College. For those of you that don't know where we are, we're located directly downstairs for the Cross Cultural Center and the Office of Student Affairs. We do events such as the Cross Culture Retreat. We have speakers. We're doing a trip to the Tons tomorrow. We also work with homeless shelters. We do a lot of variety of volunteer work as well as work around diversity in cultural education. One of the projects that I'm really proud to be a part of is that uh, we, the Cross Culture Center is teaming up with a group of faculty and we've created something called the Safe Zones. The Safe Zones project is um, a project to educate faculty and staff around issues regarding AB 540 and LGBTQ students. A lot of times students who are we call the other, who do not fit in, who sometimes may need a friend, um, are looking for support and the Safe Zones Project seeks to find and create a campus for all members of our community, regardless of social economic status, regardless of immigration status, regardless of your sexual orientation, regardless of your race, gender, whatever, that you have a safe place to be and support people who can help you. So I'm really proud to say that we're starting our Safe Zone Projects. Tomorrow is our first Safe Zone training. If you're a faculty member or a staff member in the audience and would like to participate, it is still possible to sign up. Uh, once you go through our safe training, you'll get, you will become what we call an ally, and you'll have an ally sticker, which you can then display on your office. That's letting students know that this is a safe place that they can go to discuss and get help. So if you're interested in safe zones, please see me after. I'm going to be at the back table over there. No, no, I see and I can get you signed up. If you can't get on Friday tomorrow, because it's short notice, we will be running this again. So if your faculty and staff are interested, let me know. Um, a couple of announcements I'd like to make. Uh, we have copies of Evelyn's book. It's right over here in the bookstore. That's our bookstore over there. Um, so she will be available to sign a few books afterwards. If you're interested, it's twenty-four dollars. Oh. Um, I would like to thank a lot of people. Something like a conference of this size does not happen on its own. Some of you may just be here for the keynote, but really, what happens afterwards is that there will be three more panels of students presenting their papers, all around the issues that they researched and have brought forth around the theme of crossing borders, creating culture. Um, a lot of folks would like to thank the first person is Mikage Hiroki. She's all the way back there. Give her a big hand. She's a <laughs> Other members of the conference committee who could not be here would be O.T. Corrales, Marjorie Smith. I believe Isabel Riddell is here. Isabel, are you here? Yeah. Hey, Isabel. because obviously it's a big endeavor, so we really do thank and appreciate their help. So, um, without further ado, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Sylvia Villanueva. She's a professor in the English department, and she also teaches Chicano and Chicano studies. Um, I've known her now for a couple years and was first exposed to her book um, in a class I was taking at Cal State LA in 2009. And when I asked her to come and speak to my classes, she graciously, very, very graciously accepted. And um, I was hooked on Evelyn <laughs> ever since. So I um, just wanted to give you a little bit of background on Evelyn. She is the author of December Sky, Beyond My Undocumented Life. 
is the true story of her experience as a Central American child transplanted to suburban Los Angeles, among the one million who took part in the Salvadoran diaspora of the 1980s. Her story recounts a risky trip through Mexico to flee a civil war and her years as an undocumented student with American ideals who realizes her vision of a college degree. December Sky is one of the thousands of unspoken success stories made possible by the Amnesty Act of 1986, which allowed so many to reach far beyond their underground lives as undocumented immigrants. And as the posters here um, can attest, this is, Evelyn's story is one of millions. Um, Ms. Cortez Davis earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from UCLA in 1992. She is a proud US citizen and practices engineering in, right here in Southern California, where she lives with her husband and daughter. So please help me welcome Evelyn Cortez Davis. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the amazing effort that gets put into this conference. So I want to start off by thanking everyone who was involved with it, who uh, invited me to participate in this. And I have some things that I'd like to say. The United States of America is a nation of immigrants. To paraphrase, President John F. Kennedy, most Americans are either immigrants or descendants of immigrants. The contributions of immigrants pervade every aspect of American life, whether or not we choose to recognize them. I'm honored to be here today to share my personal experience as an immigrant to this country. For those of you listening today who are immigrants yourselves, some of what I have to say may have a familiar ring to it. For those of you who are not immigrants, whether you are first generation or 40th generation American born citizens, my hope is that my remarks will lend some insight into at least one experience and one very humble but very biased opinion among the estimated 12 million undocumented immigrants living and working in the United States today. I stand here today as a proud citizen of the United States and as a former undocumented immigrant. I'm also a wife, a working mother. I'm a taxpayer, an advocate for the environment, a college graduate, a civil engineer, a public servant, and an aspiring writer. I'm an independent voter, and I participate in every election, local, state, and federal. I am a walking paradox. I'm not a criminal or a job-stealing, unskilled worker or a terrorist or a tax dollar thief or any other caricature of the undocumented immigrant fed to us by the mainstream media. According to those blatant stereotypes, I should not, cannot, and do not exist. And yet, here I am with all of you at Pasadena City College, trying to bridge the gap between living the life I once lived as an undocumented immigrant, that underground life, to being understood accepted and recognized as a contributor to society. To be understood, not as an anomaly and not as an exception to the rule, but as a demonstration of the potential that can be reached when an opportunity is afforded and realized. So how do we bridge that gap? particularly in the midst of the xenophobic rhetoric and relentless scapegoating that is inevitably triggered by election year politics. Well, I can only shed light on this from my personal point of view. I'm not a professor. I'm not a social scientist or a political pundit. 
I'm simply an ordinary person who was granted an extraordinary opportunity to live the American dream. I speak to you on the authority of my personal experience alone. Based on that experience, I will suggest to you one possible step for all of us, citizens or not, to help immigrants in general and undocumented immigrants in particular to go from underground to understood. Find your voice and use that voice to share our common ground. Encuentra tu voz y utilízala para compartir lo que tenemos en común. Sorry, I had to slip that in. <laughs> no matter what situation or struggle you may face each day, as a first generation college student, as a working parent, as a person of color, as a gay man, as a job seeker, as an English learner, as an immigrant, as a liberal or as a conservative, as a human being, you are not alone. No matter, no matter what struggle it is, there are others who can form your voice with you. Finding our voice and acknowledging the common ground we share with the rest of the world is the first step to being understood. In order to project a voice that truly speaks to others and demands understanding, we need to recognize and embrace every part of who we are. I think we can all agree that we must really understand ourselves before we can expect to be understood by anyone else. The job of redefining the commonly accepted misperceptions about who immigrants are, in particular undocumented immigrants, is a tall order. Until we're able to find that voice and articulate the fundamental values, qualities, joys, and everyday struggles of immigrants as human beings, I believe that immigrants will continue to be seen as the others, the aliens, and the gap in understanding will remain. The journey to find that voice can be a tricky one, I won't lie. I have known firsthand how it feels to live without a voice. My life ruled by silence and fear. When I was 12 years old, my parents my sisters and I fled El Salvador to escape a civil war and economic despair. Like hundreds of thousands of other Salvadoran families, my parents faced a heart-wrenching choice. Do we stay and face the danger of the civil war that had taken a hold of the place we lived? Or do we leave our entire lives behind and start over in America? with less than nothing. Even with the prospect of a life underground, living in the United States offered a glimmer of hope for a better future, away from the violence. We did not have visas to come to the US, but that did not distract from the urgency of my parents' need to keep my sisters and me safe. We had a glimpse before our move of what might lay ahead for us. See, when I was four years old, my mother moved to the United States to work and spent the next eight years of my life working in the United States for years at a time. She made three different trips between 1974 and 1981, sending us money to help my family stay afloat. My mother worked as an undocumented housekeeper and nanny for years caring for other people's children while her own were thousands of miles away. As a working mother myself now, I find myself just a few miles from my own daughter, just for a few hours every day. Knowing what I know now, my mother's sacrifice is my involvement even today. She separated herself from my sisters and me so that she could 
help provide a better chance for us. Through all those years, we had seen the United States and its endless promise through her eyes, through her letters, through her cards, and the occasional phone call. So the choice was clear, and when my mother traveled back to the U.S. in 1981, we came with her. Finding my own voice was a long and complicated process. It took a long time for me to finally embrace every part of who I am. Once here in the U.S., our new lives depended on maintaining absolute silence about our immigration status. My sisters and I lived under the strictest orders not to disclose our situation to anyone, not even the closest of our friends. I enrolled in the seventh grade, middle school in the San Fernando Valley, without knowing a word of English. And so the silence began. In class, it was actually very easy to just blend in the background. One of my eighth grade teachers, though, Mr. Charles Girardi, I will never forget him, was the first person ever to challenge me to get used to the sound of my voice. He taught English as a second language at Christopher Columbus Junior High School in Canoga Park. My unsure teenage voice with the heaviest of Spanish accents lacked the confidence I used to have as a star student growing up in El Salvador. I had no desire to raise my hand or participate in any way. But that Mr. Girardi, he didn't let me off the hook. He called on all his students, often as making us stand up to speak and praising us at every possible opportunity when we did share our thoughts. Building our confidence was as much a part of his curriculum as vocabulary tests and reading practice. I caught a glimpse of a possible future when the students in the mainstream English classes would no longer mock my accent or laugh when I made a mistake. And eventually, the laughter did stop. So wherever you are, Mr. Girardi, thank you, thank you, thank you. I remained an undocumented student when I was accepted to UCLA, the only college campus to which I applied in 1987. At that time, there were no support networks for students like me. Living underground, living a secret life was simply a fact of life for me. Concentrating on my academic courses was difficult. My reality was limited by the ever-present fear that anyone could take away my dream with a single call to immigration authorities. While my classmates focused on our engineering assignments, I worried whether the next financial aid counselor I met with, with access to my personal information, would report me and, by default, my entire family to immigration. While my fellow UCLA Bruins pledged sororities and enjoyed intramural sports, I attended clandestine meetings where counselors and fellow students attempted to share information about our new situation as underground undergrads. As my friends splurged on basketball tickets and the latest fashions and gadgets, I stretched every penny of my financial aid checks with the hope that I would never have to go to my parents and ask them for money I know they couldn't spare. The summer after my freshman year at UCLA, I got word that the grants and scholarships in my financial aid package would be significantly reduced come my second year and replaced with loans. So financial pressure continued to be an everyday companion until I graduated. I could have found a million excuses to goof off, a million distractions to take me away from my focus and the job at hand. But 
I knew I had a job to do. I was the first person to attend college in my entire family. I couldn't squander that extraordinary opportunity that I had been afforded, and I was determined to excel no matter what. I would eventually, eventually find my voice through the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, or amnesty. This law was made possible by the work of countless people whom I will never meet, and signed by President Ronald Reagan. Two years into my stay at UCLA, my family was granted amnesty, along with three million other people. We got our permanent residence, our green cards, our papers. I had found the voice I needed I was determined to speak for those who could not speak for themselves. So, much to some of my relatives' dismay, I marched on campus. I spoke at rallies. I wrote to the Daily Bruin. Anything to shed light on a topic that in the early 1990s no one wanted to discuss. At the time I attended UCLA, I had no idea there was a law that made it possible for me to receive the financial assistance I so desperately needed. Later I found out the law was the 1985 Leticia Aid decision, which allowed students who had resided in California for one year to pay instant tuition fees and made them eligible to receive state and federal financial aid. This law was enacted just a couple of years before my arrival at UCLA, and it was overturned in 1992, the year I graduated. This Leticia A. window of opportunity, very narrow, and I was not even aware that it existed but I would never have been able to take advantage of that opportunity and put it to good use if I had not prepared myself academically in high school before I knew the opportunity would be there for me. This narrow window would have been useless if the teachers who saw potential in me had not insisted that I pursue my education to the fullest extent possible. This narrow window would have been missed if my parents had not been willing to risk deportation through the ordinary decision to file a college application. An application that would tell the state of California exactly who we were, exactly where my parents worked, exactly where we all lived, everything we had been working to hide for so long. But it was a risk well worth taking. Even with the opportunity to attend college, though, my future would have still been in limbo without the path to legalization and citizenship that was opened by the 1986 amnesty. I'm proud to say I've been a working professional since my graduation from UCLA nearly 20 years ago. Access to higher education has increased my contributions to the economy by significantly increasing both my earning potential and my direct contributions through state and federal income taxes. And since becoming a homeowner, property taxes as well. Since graduating with my Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering, I have repaid every cent invested in my higher education over six times through income taxes alone. Trust me, I'm an engineer, I checked that map. <laughs> I am living proof that investing in the education of youth, regardless of immigration status, makes financial sense for our state and for our country. I mentioned that the Leticia A. window of opportunity closed shortly after I graduated from UCLA. For 10 years, after that, the possibility to attend college for many promising, bright students was essentially out of reach. California's Assembly Bill 540, passed in 2002, 
and restored some of this access by allowing in-state tuition for California residents without regard to immigration status. But AB 540 did not offer financial assistance. More recently, Assembly Bills 130 and 131, known as the California Dream Act, have once again made access to higher education more financially feasible for highly motivated immigrant youth who were brought here as children and for whom in many, many cases, this is the only country they have ever known. As we head into a presidential election this year, you'll be sure to hear more about the Dream Act. So I thought I might give you a heads up today in case you have not heard about it yet. The Federal Dream Act, the Development, Relief, and Education of Alien Minors Dream, would offer a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who were brought to the U.S. before age 16, who attend college or serve in the military, and are of good moral character. In other words, they don't have a criminal record. The Federal DREAM Act has been introduced and defeated in Congress several times over the last few years. As the immigration debate heats up over the airwaves, it's likely that this topic will come again come up again, and the one question I hope gets answered is this. How do we tap into this highly motivated group of bright young people who might include some of our future doctors, engineers, and entrepreneurs? Years after graduating UCLA, I decided to write and publish my family's immigration story. In writing my story, my hope was that we would not forget where we began and why we're here in the first place. The name of my book is December Sky, Beyond My Undocumented Life. I believe some of you may have read it. I completed my book project one lone paragraph at a time over the course of about 10 years. At first, I launched my book project as amnesia insurance to ensure I didn't forget the details of my family story, because I sure was starting to forget. At that time, my hope was that my young nephews, nieces, and cousins, and my own unborn children someday at that time, might have access to our family history without needing to know what questions to ask, or without relying on the fading memories of the older generation. As a young adult at the time, that might have been the first time I realized I was part of that older generation. And I had a responsibility to remember. Never did I dream that others might be interested in my family's experiences or that the elusive voice that it took me years to find would be one with which so many could identify. I've spoken with students from China, from the Philippines, from Armenia, from Africa, from El Salvador. Once, twice, three times removed from the immigration experience at times. And they can connect with what I have to say. And that is overwhelming to me. And that speaks to the power of sharing one story, finding that voice. And since I'm being frank, I might as well tell you, never did my parents or my family members anticipate that I would so willingly and so publicly want to share our very private challenges and struggles. So I'm grateful that they allowed me the freedom to do so. Some of them are here today. So I hope I can do justice to our family story. Before I could search for my voice, I had to start by finally giving my mother hers. She had tried for years to tell me all that she experienced over the years, but I wasn't ready to hear it. It went one ear and out the other, you know. Like all stories that our parents tell us when we're little. But once I was ready, I sat with my mother for hours on end, interview after interview over the course of about six months. 
This was done the old-fashioned way, in person and with pen and paper, long before iPads and Skype. All we needed was time and patience to wade through all my unanswered questions about my parents' motivations, about my mother's own underground experience, about the details of her life here when she was alone, about her bouts with discrimination and the pain of her separation from her daughters and her husband for years at a time. I was able to capture some of the details of my mother's journey in my book. She was only 27 years old when she came to the U.S. for the first time. I was only four. When we traveled together across Guatemala and Mexico during nine fateful days in December of 1981 that brought us to California, she was only 35 years old. As a woman traveling with four young girls, ages 10 to 18, without papers, through two countries and three borders. The risks were unimaginable. Some people who have read my book have commented that my mother comes across as an extraordinary person. When I hear this, I truly feel like I did my job as a writer. My family story, it's not unique. Mothers and fathers from all over, from Guatemala to Haiti to China to Bangladesh, find themselves forced to separate from their children in order to provide a fighting chance for them. Whether by leaving to find work elsewhere or by sending their children away so they can find a better opportunity. Many of these children end up raised by grandparents or extended family. Some are even left to their own devices, often for years at a time. So this situation creates children who hardly recognize their own parents' voices, their own parents' faces. How many of you are parents? Let me see a show okay. I presume most of you had or have parents. So you, maybe you can still connect with this. Can you comprehend the level of desperation that would be necessary for a parent to leave their child behind? Can you imagine how it might feel to be the child left behind? If you would indulge me, I'd like to ask you to part participate in a little exercise with me. You up for it? Yeah. All right. I would like for you to imagine. If you want to close your eyes, do, but please don't fall asleep. <laughs> imagine, think back, and remember yourself at 12 years old. You were probably in the seventh grade. What do you look like? What stylish clothes are you wearing? Where do you live and what school do you go to? Do you recall the sound of your voice at 12 years old? Your favorite music and all the things you thought you knew about life and the world? Can you see yourself? Now, think about the person closest to you at that time in your life. The person who supported you the most loved you the most, and that you loved the most in return. Perhaps it was a parent, or a grandparent, or a sibling, or another relative or friend. Think of the fondest memory you shared with this person. Think of how you felt when this person smiled at you. You see? Now try to imagine your life and how it might have been different if that person were suddenly thousands of miles away from you. Remember, this is you at 12 years old. At that young age, would it comfort you much to know that this person left 
so that you could have food to eat every day? What would you do, if anything, to be reunited? What would you be willing to risk to be back at their side? What sort of motivation and fearlessness would it take for a young child to set off on a journey of thousands of miles and unthinkable dangers by him or herself to find the parents from whom they've been separated? This happens more often than you would think. There's a recent documentary that tells the story of several of these children traveling alone on their journey to the United States, looking for their parents. If you get a chance to see it, the name of the documentary is Which Way Home? And I gotta warn you, even for those hardcore documentary folks, this is gonna be a hard one to watch. Men, women, and children risk their lives every single day for a chance to come to the United States. We hear about people caught crossing the border, being rounded up by authorities on the nine o'clock news all the time, don't we? We seldom hear about what these individuals had to go through to get to the border in the first place. This journey is long and treacherous. Many have little food or money. They're exposed to corrupt police, crime, gang violence, and the elements. For Central American immigrants, the trip involves multiple border crossings. Women on this trek are routinely raped and murdered. The border fences are up. State after state, is passing legislation reminiscent of Arizona's Senate Bill 1070 that allows police to demand papers of anyone they suspect might be undocumented. Anti-immigrant groups line the border armed with rifles and American flags. And yet, despite all of this, they keep coming. The people keep coming. Why? Can you think of any situation so extreme, so dire, so impossible, that it would force you to risk your life to get away from it? <coughs> this must be very difficult to comprehend until you've lived it. And yes, people live it every day, and people choose to escape it every day. But. Why would anyone choose this treacherous, risky path to the U.S. rather than applying for legal residence? Seems like a perfectly logical question. We hear about the so-called back of the line, particularly in political debates about immigration reform. Tell me if you've heard this. We believe in legal immigration. So everyone should just get in the back of the line. I know I've heard it, maybe not quite like that. Let's talk about this line. According to the US Department of State, families can be separated for over 10 years, many, many, many of them much longer, because of visa backlogs. As of November of 2011, there were over 4.5 million visa applicants on record whose applications are being sponsored by family members who are U.S. citizens or legal residents or by employers. There's a maximum number of visas issued each year to applicants from any one country. So the line will take many, many, many years to process and the backlog will never go away. So what happens if you happen to be one of those people who doesn't have a family member who is a US citizen or a legal permanent resident or if you don't have an employer who's willing to sponsor you. Well, you can try to get in the back of the diversity visa application line. Approximately 50,000 diversity visas are available each year 
from countries with historically lower levels of immigration to the United States. A computer-generated random drawing selects recipients of these coveted diversity visas. People from countries who have sent more than 50,000 immigrants to the U.S. over the past five years, however, are not eligible to apply for the diversity visa program. So, if you are from, get this list going, Bangladesh, Brazil, Canada, mainland China, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Jamaica, Mexico, Pakistan, Peru, the Philippines, South Korea, the United Kingdom, or Vietnam, you do not get a place in line. Getting in the back of the line would sound like a perfectly logical suggestion until you realize the limitations placed on who is allowed to stand in the line in the first place. According to a study by the Pew Hispanic Center, 45% of undocumented immigrants in the U.S., nearly half, entered this country legally, and they overstayed their legal visas. They never hopped a border fence or crossed a desert. They were never smuggled in. When you think of the estimated 12 million undocumented immigrants in the U.S. today, who do you see? Well, if you subscribe to the stereotype of the Latino immigrant, the image that comes to mind is probably quite narrow. You probably might see a single Latino man with dark Climbing a fence, maybe standing at a corner looking for construction work as a day laborer, maybe selling oranges at a busy intersection, mowing lawns, or maybe picking strawberries in a field. If you happen to imagine a Latina woman, the stereotype dictates that she must clean houses or raise the children of wealthy, wealthy neighborhoods. And of course, she has to have lots and lots and lots of babies. Neither of them would speak English or pay any taxes, even the sales tax everybody knows we all have to pay. I could go on, but I think you get my gist. I wonder, is there any room in that misguided, stereotypical image of the undocumented immigrant for, let's say, a young high school valedictorian? who's been in this country since before she could walk, who dreams of a college degree? How do we use our voices to begin shifting these limiting images and allow our youth to achieve their maximum potential? Everyone finds their voice in their own way. Not everyone will have a single miracle change their lives as permanently as Amnesty did for my family and me. Not everyone will choose to reveal their personal stories as publicly as I have. But whether or not you're an immigrant yourself, rest assured that every one of our voices matters in this public debate about immigration. Perhaps you will find your voice when you hear a derogatory remark about immigrants that bothers you, and you decide to do something about it. What do you do when someone in your closest circles uses a term that you deem offensive? Do you pause and call them on it? Do you post the occasional tweet or Facebook message to express how much it bothered you? Perhaps when you point out how their words affect you, at the very least, you will find out whether they are aware of the potential negative impact of their words despite their intent, and ultimately, have you both discover the power of your voice. Perhaps others yet will find their voice at the voting booth. In 2011, nearly 700,000 immigrants became naturalized citizens of the United States. For those of you who are able to vote and do, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. For those of you who are unable to vote, I have a message specifically for you. Your 
voice should not be limited by whether or not your citizenship or your age precludes you from voting. Your lives, your contributions, your struggles, your voices matter, and you are certainly not alone. You can call on those of us who are free to speak. You can write letters to elected officials to explain why change might be needed. You can find strength in numbers through some student support groups like the Dream Network or AB540 student organization. You might choose to join the next march, be it for immigrant rights or any sort of human right, or volunteer for a worthy organization. Your choice to engage just might inspire someone who has the power to vote to actually do it. For those of you who are eligible to vote and don't, I have an entirely different message for you. <laughs> but I want to remain civil, so maybe I can speak to you individually afterwards. I'll be in the hallway. In any case, I plead with you, for every one of you who is eligible to vote, please register and vote. Please find that voice, one way or another, and exercise it. The process of finding one's voice will be different for everyone. It can be subtle. No soapbox or megaphone is necessarily required. Perhaps you'll hear a disturbing story about an anti-immigrant crime and you will be compelled to share it. Sadly, I hear about them all the time. Just a few, a few weeks ago, Shaima Alawadi, a 32-year-old Iraqi immigrant and mother of five, was murdered in the San Diego suburb of El Cajon, shaking an entire community. The note taped to the front door of their house reportedly said, this is my country, go back to yours, terrorists. Authorities are treating this as an isolated incident but are not ruling it out as a hate crime. I don't know about you, but with a note like that, I can't imagine any other feeling than hate that might have inspired it. In 2009, Brisenia Flores, a beautiful nine-year-old American citizen, was brutally murdered in her Arizona home as she pleaded for her life. She was shot in cold blood by an anti-immigrant vigilante who mistakenly believed that Brisenia's family was linked to the drug dealers in the area. <coughs> Did you know about Brisenia? Have you heard her name? Have you ever seen her picture? Do you think you might have heard her name if the same horrific crime had been committed at the hands of a person of color? Or if the innocent life taken had not been that of a young Latina? The PBS program Need to Know recently aired video footage of over a dozen U.S. Border Patrol agents beating and tasering Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, a 42-year-old Mexican immigrant, two years ago in May of 2010. The disturbing footage shows how Anastasio laid in the dirt, hogtied and defenseless, begging for his life at the top of his lungs as border patrols continued to beat him. He later died at the hospital from his injuries. Anastasio had previously lived in the United States for 25 years and was the father of five U.S. born citizens. Two years after his death, the Department of Justice reports that he has continued to investigate this incident, but no charges have ever been brought against the agents responsible. Some of us hear about these disturbing stories all the time, but perhaps more of us need to hear about them to achieve the level of awareness that we need for change. On the other hand, perhaps
perhaps the story you choose to share will be an uplifting one. One of remarkable achievement and hope. A story that highlights those contributions by immigrants that I alluded to earlier. Perhaps the story that helps break down some of those stereotypes that are as persistent as they are damaging. Have you heard a positive story about an immigrant lately? Well, you're about to. Dulce Matus, a 27-year-old undocumented immigrant, put herself through college and received a Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering. As the president of the Arizona Dream Act Coalition, Dulce promotes a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who, like herself, was brought to the U.S. as a child. Dulce Matus was recently selected as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. Young Shin is the executive director of Asian Immigrant Women Advocates, a workers' rights organization in Northern California. A Korean immigrant, Young earned a law degree from Hastings College of Law and launched a group to empower Asian immigrant women in California factories to create healthier working conditions, both in the garment and the electronics industries. Have you used garments lately? Or electronics? Then this has to do with you. Recognized locally and nationally, Young is using her voice to advocate for the rights of workers and immigrant women alike. Dr. Alfredo Quinones Hinojosa, also known as Dr. Q, is a 43-year-old internationally renowned neurosurgeon, professor of oncology and neurosurgery at John Hopkins University Medical School. When he was 19, Dr. Q was picking tomatoes as an undocumented farm worker in the fields of California. He attended community college and transferred to UC Berkeley, eventually graduating from Harvard Medical School where he received his medical degree, cum laude. The same hands that harvested tomatoes are literally saving the lives of cancer patients today. Doctor, thank you. Thank you. back to one of my earlier points, investing in the education of all youth, regardless of immigration status, makes sense for all of us. When you think of a case like Dr. Q, I would ask that you ponder this question. What are the drawbacks of not offering these highly motivated youth the chance to better themselves and contribute fully to society? You might wonder if anyone will care to listen once you find that voice. At one point in my life, I sure wonder about that. Turns out folks did want to listen. Once you find it, I suggest to you that the most impactful way is to use that voice to share our common ground. If you were given an opportunity to write about a personal experience, perhaps in your English midterm, like what would you choose to document? No matter what voice your personal experience will lead you to, you will find that you are not alone. Finding your voice and sharing our common ground is the first step to being understood. Until we're able to find that voice, and share the very values that unite us as human beings, I believe that gap in understanding will continue to exist and will inevitably widen. I am infinitely grateful for this opportunity to share my story with you and some of my humble and very biased opinions. I'd like to take a moment to recognize my mother, Rosario Cortez, who is here with us today. My sister, 
Sisters, Milady and Daisy are also here, so thank you and happy Father's Day to both of you as well, my beautiful niece, Andrea. I would like to leave you. I would like to leave you with a couple of final thoughts. In a nation where so many can trace their origin to immigrants, should it really be necessary to be reminded that immigrants are human beings first? <coughs> Citizens and immigrants alike, we must find that voice to help us share the everyday struggles and joys of immigrants as human beings to remind ourselves that immigrant rights are human rights and that immigrants are not so alien after all. Redefining all of those stereotypical misperceptions about who immigrants are, particularly undocumented immigrants, may seem like an insurmountable task. But I gotta tell you, I believe that redefining the immigrant experience and being understood absolutely, positively can be done, even if we have to do it one single enlightened voice at a time. So listen, I've spoken for quite a while, shared many thoughts, many examples, many ideas. You might still be processing some of that on the way home on the freeway. So if you remember nothing else, from my remarks this afternoon. Please, please remember this. Find your voice. Find your voice. Find your voice. In Spanish, we would say, Encuentra tu voz. Encuentra Tu voz. For those of you that have already found it, maybe you want to join me on the second part of that. Encuentra tu voz. 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 Time now for Q and A. So um, my colleague Natalia and I will be walking around with microphones. So if you have a question for Evelyn, um, just raise your hand and we will try to find you. I don't have a question, but what I want to say to you: What the community most is the fear we are human beings. In every country I come from, we went through the form of the partition, the black box of politics, and every country has its share. But what I want to do to say to you, and the biggest key word that we all remember, we are human beings. Should be treated as such, should be recognized as such, and each individual is treat every other person as a human being. That's the biggest gift we can give to anyone. I was at that picture. And that's it. Earlier you spoke about uh, the DREAM Act, and uh, I know Raul Grijalva, representative from Tucson, Arizona, has introduced it at least a couple of times. Are you working with any political action groups or anything like that to help get more people like him elected to push this act forward federally? I get involved in any possible way that I can. So if you have a contact name for me, I'll be right over there. Um, there, there are so many ways that, so many different groups that are involved in trying to um, formulate a version of the DREAM Act that can proceed and get past both houses. Um, the reality in, especially in a presidential election year, that it is going to be a difficult thing, a difficult discussion, but it's not unreasonable to have it introduced and passed. I sincerely believe that. So um, if, if I believe what it will take, though, is to have representatives elected, like the one that you are speaking of, um, who are um, understanding of what this struggle actually is, um, many of the representatives that are voting on this legislation, I don't think have ever really understood the entirety of the issue. And so um, it's a good suggestion for all of us. 
I have a question, but to your mom. If I'm, if I can ask. She's more than happy to oblige. <laughs> Mommy. Is it Spanish or English? Okay. Um, if Spanish, it's better because of my name. Okay, I think it's Spanish. Like, viendo a su hija ahorita como está ahí arriba, hablando con todos, todos estamos como admirando cómo se siente usted como una madre de Dios. Looking at your daughter up there speaking to all of us, how do you feel? Uh, me siento muy orgullosa por el, todo el trabajo que mi hija hace y, y de todas mis hijas me siento orgullosa y, y además que ella me tome en cuenta en estos momentos tan especiales en la vida de ella. Uh, yo me siento, es eh, difícil, de, no puedo de, describir la felicidad que me da porque cuando ella era estudiante yo sufrí mucho por ella, pero ahora estoy la que estoy recogiendo la, la bendición por, porque ella está es la veo con todos sus éxitos estoy muy orgullosa y toda la familia está orgullosa talking about my my daughter I feel so proud of her all the work she has done uh, make me feel uh, happy and I appreciate what she's doing for me because she put me in this position which I never, if anybody read the book, you know I never thought I'm going to be in this position. That is very uh, rewarding for myself. Rewarding because after working so hard, I feel like uh, it's hard to describe the way I feel. But uh, I know every mother of you, like you as a student, I invite you to Go for, go for it, you know? Don't, don't let it start. That's the key for every single person in this country. You need to study, you need go for your goals. No matter what, the, the sky is the limit. She was extraordinary. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for your talk. I'm Professor Arjun. Um, I have a question about your writing process. You said you wrote um, a few paragraphs over a very long period of time, and you introduced yourself as a, a, a budding writer or a, you know, desiring to become a writer. Um, I wonder if you could talk about your writing process a little bit and um, maybe write down your memoir, how that has affected um, I don't know, future writing goals or your memory about what has happened? What a great question. The process for me, because I, I, I mentioned when I was uh, speaking earlier that I, I kind of did it as amnesia insurance. And that's honestly what I, I wanted to document and, and, and write down everything that I could possibly remember for a time when I wouldn't be able to remember. And being an engineer, I don't know how many, how many future engineers do we have in the room? Um, I wrote down something that looked very boring. Um, I wrote down an itinerary. That's how my process began. I wrote down notes. I wrote down the day that we left, what time did we leave, what time did we cross the border at Guatemala, how many hours did we spend at each stop, where did we stay, and it was, it was literally a, an account of the details of the trip, it's the nine days. Because those were the details that I felt were going to start to leave me possibly the fastest. Once I wrote all of that down, I translated the itinerary into narrative. And once I wrote the narrative about the trip itself, and I discovered, wow, you know, I, I, this is a story. This, there's an actual story here. It didn't make any sense. This story was completely out of context. There's a story about some family that's moving and there's no reasons why, there's no what happens after you got here, there's no explanations. And so I started to fill in those blanks after I had nailed down what I wanted to write about the trip itself. But if you remember what I said, is, is those details of the trip, um, that was a really grueling process because I, I was on the trip, I was 12. The one that really remembered everything and how it all really went down was my mom. And so those interviews, those hours on end that I spoke to her, 
and I interviewed her. I came prepared with all sorts of questions for her, and it, it really helped to draw out the kinds of details I wanted. I wanted to um, recall exactly what he ate, how did things smell. I, that's the kind of memory that I wanted to preserve, and I'm hoping that that's the kind of memory I did preserve. Once we um, we got here, and um, there there were there's probably a few books about what happened once we got here that I might have written, but I decided to um, I decided to select some of the things that um, I would describe, um, really with my nephews and my nieces in mind. They were toddlers at the time. Jesse, Frank, Brian, and Alex, they were little babies, two years old. And I looked at them and I thought, they will have no idea what their moms and their grandparents did, why we're here. And so I'm thinking about what would they want to know? What would, what would I wish they would ask? And those were the questions that I went at it with and saying, why did we leave El Salvador to begin with? And um, it turns out that uh, my nephew, Jesse, was the one that really sparked the movement from who actually published the story. I wrote it, and it sat on the shelf for a while. And um, I had sent the manuscript to a couple of publishing houses. The University of uh, Houston had actually accepted the manuscript and wanted to publish it, and we were not able to come to agreement on the terms of the contract for them to publish my story. So I withdrew and I said, well, it's publishable. I'm happy, I'm gonna put it on the shelf. And when my nephews and nieces are ready to read it, I have it right here. And my nephew, Jesse, was a teenager at the time, and um, a young teenager at the time, came to me and said, Awi, Awi said, you wrote a book about our story? What, where is it? And I said, this is it. I went to the shelf, I got the manuscript, and I handed it to him. And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, eh, I'll just, I'll wait for you until you publish it, then I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a look at it. So I decided to self-publish, and the book is entirely printed on demand. Um, I got my friend who is a um, very talented graphic artist to help me with the cover art. I went online and got my uh, barcode application on and, and I, I did it basically all myself. And if, if you have a story to tell, you've got the tools out there to be able to get um, your story um, on paper if that's, what you, if that's what you want. Sorry, that's a long way to answer. <laughs> With the success of your career and the success of publishing your book, what's next for you? I want to change the world. I said that um, I, I made a list of all the things that I believe myself to be, and I put them at the beginning of my talk, and all of those things are, are very meaningful to me. I would say in the order that I said them. And uh, being a mother is the most important thing. And so what's next for me is to make sure that my daughter has an understanding of her identity, understanding of my identity and our identity as a family um, as she goes on. When she hears discussions about immigrants, I don't want her to feel like she's removed from that. That is her. And I need her to understand that. So um, I, I, I still write. I'm still writing. If, if, you're, if you're writers out there, you know that the writing doesn't stop. It kind of takes over, you know. And, um, I, I write poetry. I have stories that I've started the process for. Um, but, you know, I'm a full-time civil engineer and a full-time mom at the same time. Um, I volunteer for the PTA. So it, it's the kind of thing that you have to work in. If you're passionate about it, you'll make time for it. But um, I would love to write another book. I have a great um, great uncle. He's an immigrant. Um, of, uh, I'm never sorry about this. 
Um, and I have a great grandfather, the best undocumented immigrants. And um, it was a very difficult road for them, but they they traveled. One was from Mexico, Albuquerque, and one was from Texas. And uh, we were both on my father's side. And um, education was really hard back, back then. And that was kind of what it was instilled on my side of the family. Uh, for me, education is still very hard for me, and I've been still dealing with it since 1984. I've been in, in colleges. Um, how, what do you uh, suggest for students like ourselves who are from um, a family member who's from the immigrant, undocumented immigrants, and are struggling to try to get through college and and is doesn't have a lot of confidence in trying to get through their their college work? Good question. And I know that there are many students who basically fall under this category. If you're undocumented, um, I, I've got to I've got to say, and I and I speak about this in my book, that um, it is a very difficult place that you're in, and that does not mean that there isn't going to be a possible future for you. I mentioned about the Leticia A decision and that law that allowed me to go to college and I had no idea why it was there or that it was there in the first place. And these opportunities are going to present themselves. The question is, will you be ready for them? And if you're able to focus on your work um, and, and find that network of support that you need, because you really are not by yourself, there are other people that are facing these same challenges. And I think that that was probably the most difficult thing for me, is to find who, who are these people. I, you know, I had no idea. I actually thought I was all by myself. And you know, going into a secret meeting of you know Counselor Joe that wanted to tell us about you know what these um, immigration questions and financial aid questions were about um, at UCLA. I, I, you know, I found myself very torn. Do I, do I actually reach out and try to get help, or is that too risky? Do I really want to do that? I'm an engineer. I, I, am a low risk sort of person. You know, I, I didn't want to do that, but I had to. I had to go and search the people that were in my same situation, and, and without that, I don't know that I would have necessarily made it through. And the thing about the thing about the Dream Act. And I go back to the DREAM Act almost on every point because the thing about the DREAM Act is the DREAM Act is going to pass or not pass regardless of whether or not you get an A in English, regardless of whether or not, whether or not you get your AA, but regardless of whether or not you transfer to Berkeley. It's going to do its thing. The question is, will you be ready for it when it does pass? Will you be ready to move forward to the next step in your life? And if you have that motivation to make it, there are enough of us out there, and I am positive, I am confident, I am optimistic that we're going to get there and have the dream I passed. But it won't matter if you know the opportunity has not been fully uh, take, you know, put to work by you. So if, if we are lacking resources or if you're not sure what it is that you need to do, you know, there are counselors who know about AB 540 and other resources that might be able to help you reach out to other students. Um, and you just ask questions. You don't have to talk about your personal situation if you're not comfortable doing that. And I would suggest that you don't if you're not comfortable doing that. Uh, but, you know, certainly to maintain, you know, keeping that eye on the prize is really important. Um, so a lot of times I think about you know, what, what might have happened if the, you know, if being at UCLA, if I had not had the amnesty of 1986 path, I would have had a degree in civil engineering with which I could do nothing. I wouldn't be hireable. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily be able to go to work and contribute in the way that I have. So what would have been my prospect? I'm not sure what I would have done. But the passage of the amnesty act I had nothing to do with that. I, there was not there was not anything that I could really do to influence that more. So I thought, I think that there are things we can do to influence whether or not the Dream Act passes. There's a senator out of Illinois, Senator Durbin, who speaks on the floor of Congress regularly, 
with stories about Dream Act eligible students all over the country. It is remarkable. If you have not seen it, go to YouTube or go to Senator Durbin's website. It is amazing because these stories, again, not unique, just extraordinary. You keep going, is what I was I know that everyone has a story and there's a voice somewhere deep inside them that just won't come out because they're afraid to. What was it that you did or how did you find your voice? For me, it, it, it was the amnesty. It was the amnesty of 1986 that I felt like I, I, because I had a piece of paper in my hand that said I am supposed to be here and I, and I have a right to be here and, and I, there was no stopping me after that. What I didn't realize is that there maybe was something that I could do to find the voice before that. And I was too afraid. I was too afraid and there was, there was very little information, there was very little support, there was very little of that. And you know, having forums like this, 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 was, this was unheard of back in 1987, 1988. Um, I think this is remarkable, and I think that if somebody here is trying to find that voice and is just, you know, not sure exactly how to do that, you know, taking these courses and as, as instructors, the, the professors here are, are, are taking an extraordinary step, I think to allow that voice to be developed, to be found. And I, I've got to commend the, the professors. I've got to, I've got to give it up. I, I think I said toward the end of my talk, the next time that you have an opportunity to write an English midterm or a final essay of some kind, what do you choose to really put down on paper and communicate about? Is it really something that matters to you, something that's important? Maybe it is personal, but guess what? The instructor's the only one that's gonna read it. Or maybe not, maybe in a few years you'll be up here. You don't know where that voice is gonna take you. And so I, I encourage you to, to find that moral courage, because it will take that moral courage for you to be able to put down something that um, every fiber in your body is telling you you need to keep inside. But I think it's worth hearing. There's a hundred books in this room. Hi, good afternoon. Um, being documented myself, um, I came from Mexico City. Um, I actually flew in a plane. Uh, we overstayed our visa, so my story is not like yours. We actually didn't have to go to the desert and things like that. We had the luxury of you know being in a plane, having air conditioner, you know. So both stories are different. Um, I actually got accepted to UCLA, but due to financial need, I need to start at PCC. Myself. Um, I'm going towards my engineering major. So there are all, all the stereotypes that you have seen. I actually own my own business. I do pay taxes. There's something called the ITIN number, which you know, even for scholarships that require your uh, social security number, which your ITIN number, the only thing they want is to uh, be able to be funded back with those money. Um, so there are very, very much stereotypes, but I want to say that you know, I am undocumented, and you know, there are those different stereotypes. Actually, I'm talking to have a. PCC, there's like United Way of Boundaries, we're an undocumented an ally group um, here that support people who are in our situation. United Without Boundaries? Yes. It's the name of the group. You yes. heard it here? Very nice. Thank you for Thank you. sharing that. Awesome. I know how um, you mentioned that there was a teacher that I guess motivated you to like, use your voice. Was there, were there any teachers that like kind of shed you from like didn't really expect you to, I guess, um, to be where you're at today. Yeah, there were a few of those. <laughs> like, what helped you, like, I guess, um, like, see, see past them or, like, not really listen to them? Well, yeah, there, there, there were 
they weren't just teachers, by the way. They were counselors. They were other people from the, from the school system that were, you know, one way or another sending the message, either setting a very low expectation, generally, of students who are coming out of ESO or English as a second language. Any, um, any achievement by students like this wasn't necessarily seen as um, a path to, you know, to, to better themselves. Um, so, as a senior in high school, for example, um, I had submitted my, um, and a, a, a undocumented senior in high school, I, I had gone to my high school counselor and uh, submitted my schedule request for my senior year, and um, I wanted to take a few advanced placement classes and honors French, and I wanted to uh, work on the yearbook, and I wanted to run track, and I, I wanted to do a lot, and I knew that I could do it, and I had a 4.0 grade point average to prove it. And the counselor looked me in the face and said, you can't keep this GPA up with this workload. I won't sign this. And they, you know, after I insisted, of course, the, the counselor said, if you want me to sign this, you're gonna have to get every one of these classes initialed by each teacher. And so that's exactly what I did, and I went, and I got the initials, and then I got my 4.0 for my senior year, and then I went and said hello to the counselor at the end of the year. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the reality is that there are going to be people who do not believe it is possible, who do not believe that you have what it takes to excel, that you do not believe that you deserve the chance to excel. And you can't be worried about those people there's going to be plenty of them, even after you're done, after you are got your degree and you're working and you're successful. There's going to be plenty of them. But you, you know that you have the ability, you know that you have the drive, then focus on the people who are reaching out to you to help. Anna Cohen is, by the way, she's not an amalgam. She's a real person. She was my chemistry teacher in high school. I didn't mention her in my talk, but I talk about her a lot in, in, in the book. Um, she, she was remarkable. She's the reason I filed an application to UCLA. I wasn't going to. She shoved the application in my hand and said, this is a homework assignment for you. You will fill this out and bring it back to me tomorrow. And she would not let me, I'd like Mr. Gerardi, she would not let me off the hook. And I, I had to grapple with, you know, how much or how little do I share with this person who clearly cares about my success? I couldn't tell her. Couldn't tell her why I was hesitant. I couldn't share with her all of the details of my family. Of course, eventually I did. But um, I needed to focus on the people that were trying to help me, not the ones who were trying to put me down. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming out here and speaking to us. It's very inspirational. Um, a personal story. I came from Romania with a friend of mine. And uh, I got the, uh, the end of the line. And I got my papers, but my friend didn't. And now she's in an apartment, and she's not going to school, she has a job, and she's afraid of moving, she's afraid of changing, and she's completely paralyzed. So it can be so difficult for a young woman. She's a 25-year-old, and she's so bright. And I just, I feel for her. There's nothing she can do. She just has to wait. And she had to renew her application two, three times, and it costed her thousands of dollars. So it can be so difficult. So I, I understand why, but everyone's going through, you know. Thank you for sharing that. It is very, very difficult. So many promising young people. And, you know, again, thinking back, thinking about your friend, thinking about a Dr. Q, what, what potential are we throwing away here? You know, what could be achieved? What, who is the next, you know, saver of lives? Who is the next Bill Gates? Are they out there? I think they might be. Um, yeah, thank you very much for writing this book. It's a very big inspiration for me. Actually, it, uh, December Sky Beyond My Undocumented Life is one of the required books for my English class. And my professor, she is amazing. She, um, she is American. Um, she cares about ES students, ESL students. She didn't. She doesn't have any uh, stereotype for those students. She really helped us out, and she recommend us this book. Uh, I 
I have cried a lot of times when I read your book because um, my family um, we we encounter very much uh, familiar familiar struggles like your family did. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's still a few? Okay, so we would want to give some time to that as well. Um, any final, anybody else want to ask a question or make a comment before we switch? Okay, well, thank you again, Evelyn. Thank you so much. We didn't get a chance to thank Dr. Villanueva for bringing Ms. Cortez Davis to PCC and also Beverly State for her uh, continued support and work.